Well, as promised from the teaser trailer for this trailer, we finally have a better look at Amazon's Rings of Power, and there is a lot to unpack in this one. If you watched my previous video on the Rings of Power teaser, I'm still under the impression that this show will not have, and is not going to have anything that remotely resembles Tolkien's text. But we'll get to that a little later. Seeing as that I don't want to waste anyone's time here, like Amazon clearly does with this show, I'm going to list my three main takeaways first, and then we'll go into each one with a more detailed breakdown and analysis afterwards. Point number one, Amazon consistently contradicts themselves and clearly cannot decipher whether or not they want this to be a part of Peter Jackson's film franchise or their own franchise. In one article, they say that this will be nothing like Jackson's films. And yet the score at the beginning of the trailer, the addition of The Hobbits, and many other factors are reminiscent of the 2001 Jackson trilogy. Number two, do not be fooled my friends, though this trailer is riddled with pretty imagery and spanning landscapes that will surely catch your eye, it is only done to distract you from the empty platitudes and nonsensical dialogue overdubbed throughout that has nothing to do with the actual story and no meaning whatsoever without the proper context. And most importantly, number three, they have seemed to coincidentally change the language used to promote this series from adaptation to based on the works of. Literally almost everything that we see is canonically inaccurate and proves that the writers and showrunners are just kind of making this stuff up as they go. Where is Celeborn and Celebrion, Galadriel's husband and daughter? Why are Elendil and Isildur alive during this time when they should have been, they shouldn't have been born for another thousand years? Why is it that they are signifying events like the crossing of the hill Karakse, the oath made by the Noldor, potentially what could be the War of Wrath, and the depiction of the two trees Telperion and Laurelin, when all those events take place in the First Age, even though this show is supposed to be focused on the Second Age? And those are just a few minor things that I brought up. We haven't even gotten to the Meteor and the Harfoots, and why either of them are a part of this show. Real quick, if you are enjoying, please make sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more videos just like this. And you can also catch me on my live stream, Max's Man Cave, every Sunday at 6 p.m. Pacific. All right, so point number one. The contradiction that I'm talking about here stems from the Vanity Fair article that we received a while back where it explicitly states that, quote, this is not the exact same world. The production design, though similar, is not trying to match the Jackson films. This is an odd statement, considering that Amazon is doing essentially what Disney did to Star Wars and Marvel. Take a pre-existing property that has an already established fan base and try to profit off that same fan base, but then including nothing of what that fan base actually enjoyed about that property in the first place. But as the constant barrage of dislike ratios proves, the Tolkien fans are not having it. But if this is so unlike Jackson's films, why does this opening sound so familiar? If you listen to the opening score in the trailer and then listen to the Rivendell score from the original trilogy, you'll see exactly what I mean. Hey John, can I copy your homework, bro? Yeah, dude, that's cool, but hey, just change it a little bit so it doesn't look obvious that you copied it. The other thing to mention is the addition of the hobbits in the show. Now, I guess we can't technically call them hobbits, you know, for copyright reasons, but we all know they're hobbits. The showrunners have stated that, quote, one of the very specific things the text says is that hobbits never did anything historic or noteworthy before the Third Age. But really, does it feel like Middle-earth if you don't have hobbits or something like hobbits in it? Hey, Jackson's films had hobbits in it, and everyone seemed to love those guys. Let's make some of our own. And nothing, says Peter Jackson in the original trilogy, quite like spanning landscapes. 
and beautiful New Zealand shots that, was, that were so wonderfully made to be home of Middle Earth. But, I mean, Amazon said it themselves, this show isn't going to be anything like what Jackson's films were, so I don't think they would actually use similar cinematography and camera work, right? Make up your mind, Amazon. Either say that this show exists within the Middle Earth portrayed by Peter Jackson, or make your own fantasy series outside of those films. You can't have it both ways. Number two, yes, some of the CGI here is incredibly stunning and just goes to show the talent behind some of these visual effects artists. But that's really all we're getting. There's no substance, there's no heart. The character dialogue playing in the background of these shots is meaningless to the furthering of the plot. In fact, I honestly have no idea what the show's plot is, and yet this trailer, more than any of the other promotional pieces, have somehow gotten people to actually be interested in the show. And I dare say it's because of these beautiful CGI shots that is giving kind of a smoke and mirrors illusion of quality. But as it's very apparent in multiple films, CGI should only be there to enhance the already good story. If the CGI is bad but the story is engaging, it won't take you out of the enjoyment. But it doesn't work the other way around. If the story is bad but the CGI looks great, it's not really going to be anything impactful or meaningful. And finally, number three, the canonical inaccuracies. Just a quick preface, I am no Tolkien scholar nor do I claim to be one, I am just a lover of the Legendarium. And these inaccuracies I'm going to address just kind of prove my point from my last video about why the show is explicitly not Tolkien. Anyway, let's get right into it. Well, let me just say first that anything involving the Harfoots, the new elf Erondir and his girlfriend Bronwyn, the castaway Halbrand who is secretly supposed to be Sauron in disguise, and this weird meteor thing can all be taken out of the equation entirely. These are made-up characters that the showrunners decided to add in, but have nothing to do with the actual text. So, already, not Tolkien. Now that that's out of the way, here's the first shot I wanted to bring up. This is supposedly either a scene during the crossing of the Hill Karakse or a traveling party in what's referred to as the Northern Waste in the land of Fornwaith. If this is supposed to be from the Hill Karakse, it's important to note that Fingolfin, Finrod, and Galadriel lead a group of elves of the Noldor across the icy pass to get to Middle-earth. So is the elf that we see in this shot Fingolfin or Finrod? Or potentially neither? My sinking suspicion, unfortunately, is that Fingolfin and Finrod, who are two of the main leaders in this tale, will not even be mentioned. But it says right here in Chapter 9 of the Silmarillion, the fire of their hearts was young, and led by Fingolfin and his sons, and by Finrod and Galadriel, they dared to pass into the bitterest north, and finding no other way, they endured, at last, the terror of the Hill Karakse. But if this is a scene from the traveling party in the Northern Waste, I'm being told by some of my friends that this could be Galadriel's hunt for Sauron due to her brother dying at the hands of Sauron, in which she would most assuredly be wanting to gain revenge for his death. This concept of Galadriel leading a raiding party of just a few elves to defeat Sauron is a huge delineation from the books, considering that nothing of this nature is even hinted at that I can find, but I digress. Once again, not Tolkien. Then we get this lackluster exchange of dialogue and a lecture session by Galadriel to Elrond. Okay, there are three main battles or conflicts that Galadriel could have potentially been a part of in the First Age that lead up to the events of the Second Age being portrayed in this show. Those are the First Kinslaying, the Crossing of the Hill Karakse, and the War of Wrath. But it wouldn't have been the First Kinslaying because she was with the second traveling party of elves that arrived late to the battle, who then led a charge to slay the Teleri, but Galadriel didn't engage due to her mother being on the side of the Teleri. So it 
couldn't have been that. And it wouldn't really have been at the crossing of the hill Karakse either, because though many elves died during this time, it was only due to the harsh and severe conditions, not some grand battle against a war band of orcs or something. So it couldn't have been that either. But what about the War of Wrath? The war to end the First Age and sink Beleriand into the sea, leaving only Middle-earth. Well, during that time, Galadriel would have been located in Middle-earth with her husband, Celeborn, and her daughter, Celebrion. This is something I mentioned earlier in the video, but rumor has it, Celeborn is dead in the show. Yeah, Galadriel's husband is just dead. Gone. He's just not here anymore. So anyway, Galadriel wouldn't have been there either. And yet, Elrond would arguably actually be the one to have taken part in the War of Wrath. So once again, Galadriel wouldn't have been there either. But listen, don't take my word for it, when even on the wiki Lord of the Rings page, it literally says, quote, she had no role in the major wars of the First Age, believing that Morgoth was beyond the power of the Eldar. See where I'm going with this? What has Galadriel fought against? The Patriarchy? Either way, this is still not Tolkien. The ironic thing about the whole exchange between Galadriel and Elrond is that if anyone has cause for seeing more, it is absolutely Elrond. Not only for taking place in the War of Wrath, a battle which lasted years and is said to be one of the most horrific in all of Tolkien's Legendarium, but also having witnessed a kinslaying of his own, but as a child when he was separated from his parents and taken by enemy captors. Needless to say, I absolutely hate this exchange and dialogue between the two. If this is any indication of how these characters are going to be treated in the show, fans are going to be overwhelmingly upset. And lastly, we have the words spoken by Elendil to his son Isildur. The past is dead. We either move forward or we die with it. Quite a lovely sentiment from a man who is part of a group of Numenorians that are literally called the Faithful. This to me is the most egregious of the writers and showrunners failings. It makes no sense in any context for Elendil to have this viewpoint and say these things. For Elendil was loyal to Iluvatar and the Valar who in the context of Tolkien's legendarium are kind of like God and angels. And he was also devoted to the love and preservation of the traditions of old Numenor. So why is he saying that the past is dead? That is easily something that the Kingsmen would say, the opposing Numenorians to the faithful. The Kingsmen were only loyal to the king and his ideologies, hating the Valar and living in fear of death and destruction. It's so odd to me that on one hand, Amazon wants to capitalize off an already established fan base, but then utilize that same fan base to completely crap on them by saying, that the past is dead. We either move forward or we die with it. And as you guys guessed, still not Tolkien. Well, there you have it, a pretty thorough breakdown of some of the things in which I saw that clearly contradict with what the wise professor wrote. Though I'm very aware that this show most likely will not have or be an adaptation of Tolkien or his works, I still think it's important to point these things out to make aware the inaccuracies and downfalls of the storytelling. But let me know what you think. Did I leave anything out of my analysis of this trailer? Let me know in the comment section below and thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video.